Welcome to day one of Gibbs Cam Fundamentals. Uh, today the focus is going to be on geometry creation and if you look through the uh, booklet of drawings in front of you uh, you'll see that we're going to start out uh, ex exceptionally simple uh, and progress through as many of these drawings as we can get through today. Uh, they get more complex as we progress through the through the stack of drawings. Um, if you look at sample three in your book, uh, this is where we're going to spend the most time when we get to this uh, example part. Uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on it, and I, I believe you're going to find that you will learn the vast majority of what you need to know about drawing in Gibbs Cam from this one example. Uh, and then uh, we'll pick up a few other little details through the rest of the drawings, but mostly the rest of the drawings will just be applying what we learn on sample three to more and more complex parts. Uh, so let's, uh, let's set some expectations for the class, uh, especially today with the geometry creation. Uh, I would like for you not to do the examples while I am doing them. Uh, I'll give you plenty of time to, to uh, complete the examples uh, after I've shown you um, or after I've demonstrated the example. Um, but I think it's more important for you to hear what I'm saying than to, you know, complete the example in the same amount of time that I do. Uh, so, so just uh, watch the drawings, make sure that you're understanding where I'm pulling the, the numbers that I'm using from uh, and where they're going. Uh, and, and I'll be giving you a lot of hints and tips and tricks and shortcuts uh, along the way. And I, I think getting those and making notes of those will be more important to you in the long run. Uh, so uh, just just watch and listen. Uh, I'll go through the example. Uh, I may go through some of them more than once, um, but uh, take notes, uh, and then I will give you plenty of time to do the example yourself. All right, so getting started, again, today is, uh, the focus today is on geometry creation. So in this Gibbs Cam interface, we're going to be focused on primarily two buttons. We may venture off into a couple of other buttons, but mainly today we're going to focus on the document control dialog and the geometry palette. The document control dialog is where I like to begin every part that I work on. Um, the name document control dialog is just a holdover for when Gibbs Cam was an Apple application, a Macintosh application. Uh, and in Macintosh, files are called documents. And the name document control dialog is just a holdover from, from that era. Uh, so you can think of the document control dialog as being simply the file control dialog. So we have the ability to do some basic file handling, just duplicating uh, some of what's available under the file menu in any Windows compliant program. Uh, so we can open an existing file, create a new file from scratch. We can save the currently open file under the default file name, which is shown up here at the top. Uh, we can save it out as a different file name. We can save a copy, which is unique to Gibbs. It allows me to uh, do two things. I can save a copy of the file out as an older version. So if I need to share a file with someone who does not have the current version of software, uh, I can save the current file out as, as just about any version that I want. Uh, additionally, if I'm working with a solid model, I can save a copy of the file without facets, which creates a much smaller file uh, when there are solids inside the file. Um, it just takes a little bit longer to open because Gibbs Cam has to recreate the fasting information when it reopens the file. Uh, but if you need to share a file and, and it's too big, you might try saving a copy and uh, have it save it without the fasting information and uh, see if that gets it small enough to, to email or whatever you're trying to do with it. And you can close the existing file or the currently open file. Uh, now, in this dialog, you'll, I will occasionally still slip up and say, you know, close the window. Uh, by that, I mean come up here to the red X and close this window, close the document control dialog, not hit the close button because this actually closes the file down. All right. Additionally, on the document control dialog, we have our machine definition. Um, 
these are the MDDs, uh, the machine definition documents. Uh, I've got some special ones here, uh, but everybody will have the generic ones, three, four, and five axis vertical mill, three, four, and five axis horizontal mill, uh, horizontal or vertical lathe with generic shank, C axis horizontal or vertical lathes, and so forth. Um, this, these are primarily to let the software know how many axes and how they're configured, um, which you know obviously is going to be taken into consideration in the creation of toolpath. So for the purposes of the first few exercises we're going to do, we're going to assume a three-axis vertical mill. Uh, we'll also do a couple of lathe parts uh, as we go. Uh, we're not going to venture outside of two-axis lathe and three-axis vertical mill uh, today on the geometry creation. But uh, so we'll start out with three axis vertical mill. Then right below that, we have our material database. Uh, now what you're seeing here is the cut data database, which I'm not a huge fan of, um, but we will assume starting off that we're working on aluminum for most of these parts. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time talking about feeds and speeds. Uh, all of you are experienced machinists and, and are and understand feeds and speeds, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that during the class. We also have a choice of working in inches or millimeters, and Gibbs does a really good job of uh, navigating between inches and metric, uh, or converting from inches to metric, uh, or mixing and matching inches and metric. Uh, and that pretty much finishes off the top, uh, the top half of this dialog as far as the first tab goes. The second tab is our comments tab. Uh, and there are two fields here. You have your part comment at the top. Uh, by default, this comment will output, will output in your program, in your G-code file. Uh, so a good way to use this is to pass information along to your setup person or to the person running the program. Uh, you know, just general program information, uh, tooling information, fixturing information, anything that you need to pass along in the header of your G-code program uh, can be put here. Then you have programmer notes. Uh, programmer notes are not going to output in the G-code file. Uh, so I tend to use this as, or this field as uh, a way to pass notes to myself, if you will. Um, so if I were to work on a program today, uh, run it tomorrow, um, and then six or eight months from now, I need to come back to this program and I've done something maybe out of the ordinary or um, just anything in the process of programming this part that I want to remind myself of at a later date, I can put a note in here concerning that. Um, if I have a particular model that I'm using as a stock model for one particular operation in order to force a certain type of toolpath or a certain, um, a certain toolpath, then you know, I can put a note to that effect under programmer notes. And the next time I open up this file, uh, you know, that's going to be one of the first things that I'll look at when I open an existing file is programmer notes. Uh, then you have your machine preferences. These are some of the preferences that used to be under your file and preferences um, and your machining preferences. Um, but under the file and preferences, these are global preferences. Uh, these apply to every file that you open up. Uh, these preferences in the document control dialog are specific to this file. Um, so you can, you can change some of your settings. Now, I don't really change these very much at all. Uh, the only one that uh, really I, I really want to spend any time at all talking about is the checkbox for use global settings for solids. Now the class today, we're not dealing with solid models, so this isn't an issue for today. But going forward, um, if you set, if you check this checkbox, then you can set global settings for your roughing and finishing tolerance as well as your fixture tolerance and fixture clearance. Uh, now these can be overridden in uh, individual processes. I have a tendency personally, and this is just me, this uh, is not, I'm not saying this is the correct way to do it, but this is what works for me. I tend to leave this unchecked. Uh, and the reason for that is I'm pretty picky about tolerances on various tool paths. Um, so global tolerances don't really work all that well for me. Uh, some of my roughing tolerances I may set to five thousandths. 
uh, on a big part where I'm leaving a, a, a good bit of stock. Uh, and I may use a half thousandths roughing tolerance on parts where I'm leaving, you know, four or five thousandths stock. So, the, you know, global settings don't really work for my style of programming. So I prefer to just set those as I go in the processes. So um, enough said there. Uh, I'm going to go back to the general tab and we're going to move down to the lower half of this page. Uh, I'm going to stretch it out just a little bit so it doesn't look cut off there. The... Um, we have two icons representing our piece of material. Um, the upper one is where we define the stock size and the part origin. Uh, so the, the six values around this define the six faces of a cuboid that represents our stock size by default, but you can create custom stock independent of this description. Uh, but it is also the work envelope, the area that you're going to be working in. It defines where the part origin is inside of that work envelope. Uh, the way that I found that most people are most comfortable learning this is to tell you to imagine a fixed origin in space. Just imagine there's an origin um, that, that is fixed and can't be moved. And then this X max, this is the maximum X value, so on a standard three-axis vertical mill, this would be the right edge of your part, the right edge of your work envelope. Uh, this is the X value at the right of the part. The X minimum would be the X value at the left edge of your part. The Y max would be the Y value at the back edge of your part. The Y minimum would be the Y value at the front edge of your part. The Z max would be the Z value at the top, the touch-off point for your tools. The Z minimum would be the uh, Z value at the bottom of your part. All right, in addition, we have a part offset with just three values. This on a vertical mill would be used primarily on a five axis vertical mill where you define a part size and origin and then you describe where that origin is relative to the pivot point of the five axis machine. Uh, if you have uh, TCP and dynamic work fixture offsets, you don't necessarily have to use these. Uh, but uh, and we're going to leave these values at zero as long as we're working on just a three-axis vertical mill. In addition, on this lower section, we have our clearance value. This is the what I call the master clearance value, or ZCP1. Z Clearance Plane 1 is the official name of this. But in understanding this, if you imagine your machine just changed tools, it's getting ready to do some machining, it's going to move to the XY position, for the start point of this tool path, then it's going to wrap it down to this clearance plane. Then it's going to start looking at the clearance planes in the process and go to that clearance plane if it's different from this one and then begin the machining. Then it's going to go to the exit clearance plane in the process once it's finished machining. Then it's going to go to this clearance plane if it's different. Then it's going to go to a tool change. Um, all of that to say that typically this clearance plane needs to be equal to or higher than any other clearance plane in the program. If not, you'll start getting the sewing machine effect where your tool goes up and down um, at, or down and up at the beginning of the, of the tool path and then up and back down and then back up at the end of the tool path. If you see that type of behavior at the machine, it means your clearance planes are probably out of, uh, out of whack. Uh, so this should be the highest clearance plane in the program. We're going to be, uh, we're not worried about part holding right now, so we're just going to say point one as though we were holding the parts in a vise. Um, lastly, we have a tool change position here. Um, if I click this button, it really does nothing other than take me to the interop positions tab, like that, and then I can say I want to define a tool change position, and then I can define the Y and X value of my tool change. Now, I don't typically use a tool change on most three-axis mills. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but for the purposes of the class, we're not going to worry about a tool change for the mills. We will for the lays, but not for the mills. All right, so let me go ahead and create a part. I'm going to create a new part, and uh, that'll work. And when I create a part, you'll see my splash screen go away and the part coming into being in the background back here. And here is our part. Let me get it moved over here so we can see it. And what I want to do is I want to look at our stock size and part origin values again. This eight inches in the X max means that from the origin, 
to the right edge of our part is 8 inches. This negative 3 means that from the origin, the left edge of our part is at x minus 3, or the left edge of our work envelope or our stock. Uh, the y max means that from the origin, the back edge of our part is at y positive 2. This y minimum value of minus 4 means that from the origin, the front of, edge of our part is at y minus 4. And then if we roll this thing around, this number, 3 inches in our z max, means from our origin plane up to the top surface of our stock is 3 inches, so the top of the part is at z positive 3. And the z minimum is at minus 8. That means that from our origin, the bottom of our part, is at z minus 8 inches. All right, let me go back to the top view here. Let's just imagine real briefly that we're working on a 12 by 12 plate, one inch thick, um, and our origin is going to be the top left rear corner. Uh, so even though it's too big for most vices, we're, it's a typical vice setup where you're touching off the, the top left rear corner. So if that's the case and our part is 12 by 12 by 1, then the right edge of our part, assuming the left edge is the origin, the right edge is going to be at x12. I'm just going to hit tab. If the left edge of our part is the origin, then the left edge is at x0. Okay. Now, the y max is the back edge of our part. If the back edge of our part is y0, then the back edge of our part is going to be at y0. All right. The y minimum is the front edge of our part. If the back edge of our part is y0 and our part is 12 inches wide, then the front edge is going to be at y minus 12. And that minus is important. All right, so we've got a 12 by 12 block here. We haven't dealt with our z's yet, though. So our Z-max is the top surface of our part. We said that we wanted our, uh, the top surface to be at zero. So I'm going to enter zero for the top. And we set our part as one inch thick. So the Z-minimum is the bottom, edge, uh, bottom surface of the part, and that's going to be at Z minus one. So there's our part, 12 by 12, one inch thick. Our origin is the top left rear corner. Our origin is the top left rear corner. All right, now just real briefly, let's assume the same part set up, uh, but with our origin in the center of the 12 by 12 plate. In that case, the right edge, if the origin is in the center, the right edge is going to be at x 6 inches. Again, if the origin is in the center and our part is 12 inches long, then the left edge is going to be at x minus 6. Our origin's in the center of a 12-inch plate. Our, the back of our part is going to be at y, 6 inches. And if our plate is 12 inches wide and our origin's in the center, the front edge is going to be at y, minus 6. We'll leave the top at 0 and the bottom at minus 1. So here's the same 12 by 12 plate with our origin at the top, sorry, at top center, uh, centered in the x and y top surface in the z. All right, at this point, if this were our stock, we would hit save, close out or X out of this window and begin drawing our, our part. All right, we'll close this uh, and start looking at sample one.